Good afternoon. My name is Oskold Melnichuk. Welcome to For the Record, another episode of a series of conversations with Ukrainian writers and intellectuals in a time of war. My guest today is Volodymyr Yermolenko. Volodymyr Yermolenko is a Ukrainian philosopher, writer, journalist, and the editor of Ukraine and History and Stories, as well as a senior lecturer at the Cave Mohila Academy. He's also the editor-in-chief of the essential website, Ukraine World, which offers a comprehensive menu of news, in-depth analysis, and the podcast Explaining, Explaining Ukraine, of which Volodymyr is the co-host. He has published important articles and essays in The Economist, Foreign Policy, Al Jazeera, and many other places. Welcome, Volodymyr. Thank you so much, Askol. It's a great honor for me. Well, first, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to have a chance to speak with you at last. Your website, Ukraine World, is full of so much fascinating material and provides so many possible avenues for conversation. You have articles and podcasts on what it's like for a mother and child to be negotiating their new lives as refugees. Uh, another one on the situation of prisoners of the Kremlin, as well as deep dives into the cultural history of Ukraine, underscoring its pull toward Europe and its differences from Russian culture. I'm hoping the next 45 minutes or so we could cover, however briefly, three areas, all of which are exceptionally fluent in. Culture and its relation to society, the differences in how Ukraine is perceived within Europe, as well as the differences between European and US attitudes, and the role that disinformation and corruption play in these differences, as well as what you imagine might be the steps Ukraine might need to take in order to recover from the trauma of war. But first, I wanna ask you an impossible question. How do we talk about war in the first place? In your conversation with Ezra Klein in the New York Times, you make an essential point, and I'm quoting you now. You can't say that the war experience is everywhere the same because it's different for a person who's on the front line. It's different for a person who was a refugee. It's different for a person who left his house or her house, but still has a place to come back to. I have several friends who are basically not sure if their houses are still there." End quote. And reading this, I was reminded of being in KU in 2018 at the Arsenal Book Fair and having a conversation with the writer Oksana Zabushko, who was underscoring that the nation was at war. While I looked around at the exuberant, joyful life around me, all these sort of young people rushing to buy books, this excitement about intellectual life, and it was hard to reconcile um, my immediate reality with the larger picture. And I think of that partly because, again, I'm speaking to you from Boston, and the war is very, very far away from us. And the challenge seems to be now is to keep to make the reality of that war somehow palpable to um, those who, for whom it is simply a story in the news. Any ideas? How oh, to make it palpable, I think the best way is to just to be curious about human stories and uh, uh, be interested in as many human stories as possible and uh, be as closer to the source uh, as you, 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 you can be. For, for us Ukrainians, it means travel a lot and therefore we, we, are, we are trying to travel a lot. And of course, it's sometimes difficult because uh, we have our commitments, family commitments, work commitments, but we try to go somewhere every week, either to places closer to the front line or to places where the war uh, took place um, five, six months ago. There is lots of to be seen even around Kyiv. Kyiv is now, well, it's it's difficult to say it, of course, for, for people outside, but Kyiv is a safe place, relatively safe place. Of course, every day we hear air, or si air raid sirens, but uh, there were missile attacks on Kyiv in uh, February and March, but not now. It doesn't mean that they cannot happen uh, later, but uh, Kyiv is, is, a, is a vibrant city right now. Lots of people, lots of movement, many people from uh, other parts of the country, of course, covered by, by the war. But as long as you go outside Kyiv to all these villages which surrounds it, you understand that, well, you, you see the traces of the war. You talk to people, you see their, their wounds, people who lost their, 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 uh, their relatives, right, the, the close people. And of course, the, the destruction, there's nothing, nothing going on around this, with, with this destruction. So if you go to villages like Moschun or Horinka or 
towns like Makariev or villages like Velika Dimirka or some others, you, you still see a lot of destruction. And destruction is just one thing. You, you need to talk to people. And uh, and these wounds, I mean, I, I will tell you one story. Recently, we went to Bucha. Uh, everybody, I think, knows the word Bucha. And there is these car cemeteries, the collection of cars who were burnt uh, uh, during the, uh, the the people trying to escape Bucha in, in February and March. And uh, suddenly a, a man came to us and, and said that, look, I recognize the car of my friend and my neighbor. And uh, he died in this car. He was burnt alive. And I will show you even the... the the remnants of his bones and we just look inside and we understand yes uh, there can be something like this uh, and this is the only thing that uh, that remained of him and he told us the story of this family who from hostom and a town of also near kiev who who tried to escape and they were just uh, shelled by by russian soldiers and uh, the man was killed uh, but uh, his wife and two his daughters hopefully survived almost miraculously. But uh, the the younger daughter, I think eight years old, uh, lost her hand and uh, the hand needed to be amputated. And I, I, I even think that she's now in America with, uh, with prosthesis and something like this. And it's just the man who was telling us the story just couldn't couldn't uh, couldn't help uh, couldn't stop crying. And this is a, a big man, you know. So and these these stories are everywhere. You just need to talk to people, and um, and this is it. I mean, the, the yeah. war is not figures. The more the war is not only figures. The war is human stories primarily. No, absolutely. Um, you know, the idea is that you are able to. Uh, being in Ukraine to get to these sites and to see these things in person, what I'm thinking about is how uh, to convey it to um, people around me here in Boston. And one of the, you say, you know, that the, I agree with you that the importance of travel um, is, uh, it, the travel is essential. And, and the fact is that I'm hoping that um, it will be possible for more uh, writers, intellectual speakers from Ukraine to come to the U.S. also because your um, personal witness and testimony are of inestimable value. They, you know, the story you just told is um, profound and intense and uh, your being an eyewitness to it carries a certain weight and gravity um, that uh, telling it secondhand does not. I also understand that there are issues with visas and difficulties of getting out of the country right now, and that is perhaps a problem that needs to be rectified and addressed. Um, but, but people in the U.S. or in Europe just can, um, you know, address uh, journalists or those websites as we have Ukraine World. We have a section stories. Yes. Just go to our our web website. We collect already several dozens of stories, and these are just personal stories of people whom we interviewed and uh, there are lots of other projects like us there is for example the our, our friends from the um, um, uh, public interest journalism lab or natalka Homenyuk and uh, lina karyakina and, and others they travel a lot across ukraine they're making videos there are lots of things done by hromatske for example independent media Lots of stories. Just, uh, just people need to to be kind of to have this thirst for 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 these human stories and to understand that really, as I said to Ezra Klein, and I I, I really stay on this point that uh, there is no common experience of the war. Uh, every uh, every single experience is unique and in a way incommunicable. So so you cannot really communicate it. Uh, you cannot really be that person who just another person we talked to, to in Bucha. Hopefully, her family is is, is okay, but she lost uh, her family lost several houses which were in the same place because there was the her mother's house and then their house. And usually, the houses of Ukrainians is not something you buy on the mortgage loan. You build through decades yourself with your hands and. Uh, these are the stories that uh, you can you can be building your house for thirty years and then lo lost it in thirty seconds. And um, yeah, this is this is it. Right, right, right. So um, maybe we can step away from 
the immediate moment and uh, try to get a sort of a deeper understanding of how we got here. Um, you've written and spoken very eloquently about um, the role of culture in Ukraine and the way it differs from um, Russian culture. Um, the in, in a really interesting essay um, on atypical post-colonialism, you write that while post-colonial nations colonized by Western European empires had to prove their identity was valid and their voices should be heard, Ukrainian post-colonialism was a struggle with a somewhat different challenge. It needed to prove that its identity existed at all, that it had not been invented by an external conspiracy. That's you know a fascinating um, premise to, uh, to, to to propose, and um, I wonder if you could uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about what created these very different sort of structures in post-colonial societies. Right. So I think uh, when we're thinking about Russian colonialism, we have to understand that it is in some aspects different from what Western societies um, were reflecting upon when we're thinking about colonialism. So uh, I think if we read Edward Said today, and this is very important to read uh, to understand that there are many things that are similar, and many things that are different. Uh, if you take maritime empires, when they colonize other people, the first thing they notice is the difference, the difference of others' identities, of their ethnicity, of their language, of their race, of their culture, of their traditions, etc. And therefore, uh, the key, I mean, reflection, this colonialism reflection of these empires was to how you can use this difference for, for the imperial purposes. And uh, the, the most tricky, the, the most obvious thing is to say that the difference is actually the hierarchical difference. So they are not only different, these colonized people, but they are lower than us and we are upper than, than them. So the difference is hierarchical. So the difference, the, the idea of difference is just a, a, a modus of, of domination. And uh, in Russian colonialism, I would say that not the difference is the instrument of domination, but the idea of sameness, if I can use this word in English, I, I'm not sure. sure it Absolutely. Exists. Yes, it does. It's, the sameness is the instrument of domination and not, not the difference. Uh, with regard to Ukrainians, to Belarusians, etc. So the Russians are just coming and saying, uh, you are the same as us. And um, this assimilation doctrine is basically the key uh, instrument of, of colonization. So not uh, um, they are not stressing the difference, they're stress stressing the sameness. And any difference that Ukrainians were trying or Belarusians were trying to portray was considered by the Russians as deviations. And uh, from here, you, you see all the story that, well, Every Ukrainianness is a kind of a deviation, and you 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 move to to article I think by Vladislav Surkov, who is one of the ideologists of Putin. I think it was one year ago or so, something like that, uh, when he said that um, Ukrainianness is is a disease, is is a deviation and and, and psychological disease. And uh, I think this is the, this is the most important thing. Uh, uh, when maritime empires uh, are talking to uh, to the colonized people, they're saying, "Look, there is a, a threshold you, you you cannot really cross. So this racial difference will be always there." Russians are saying, "No, come on, you can cross this difference. <laughs> you can cross mm -hmm. this threshold. Uh, uh, but in order to cross this threshold, you should just forget about yourself. You should forget about your language, your culture, your traditions, etc." Therefore, this attack on on culture was uh, very important in the 19th century, 20th century, and is important right now. So this colonialism through assimilation, through this, you know, spread of the concept of the, of the sameness. And I think we, we should just analyze it deeply uh, to understand it deeper uh, and uh, just understand that there is a kind of a, another type of, of colonialism, which acts not through otherness, uh, alterization, but through this idea of the sameness. Therefore, the, the, the basic concepts of the Russian uh, intellectual culture, like Siedinstva by Vladimir Solovyov, they mm -hmm. only seem to be kind of 
uh, innocent concepts, but inside themselves, this Fsiedinstva, meaning the all unity, mm -hmm. unity of everything. When when you don't really you don't really stress the difference, you stress the sameness. And it appears to be very, very dangerous thing because it appears to be an instrument of, of domination. And then they come, of course, to other nations in Central Europe and say, okay, you're you're the same as us and uh, you should erase all your culture. You should, we, we should all uh, become one Soviet people. Well, you know, it's so interesting. You actually have a wonderful uh, phrase for this and you, you write in that same article, an empire is a political project able to copy paste itself everywhere else in the world. I love that, you know, the copy pasting itself. And at the same time as you're speaking, I can't help but be struck that what you're describing is not all that different from something that I experienced living through uh, in, growing up within the United States. I mean, assimilation was the model that I first encountered when I was a kid in the 60s and and uh, and 70s. Um, we were all sort of all refugees and immigrants, children of refugees and immigrants were supposed to assimilate into the American project. Uh, and, and that only began to break down, I think as a result of the kind of different sort of the deviant thinking of the 60s um, and, and its sort of a legacy as we began to enter into the sort of um, fondness for pluralism and uh, multiculturalism as it was labeled, uh, which seemed to me nothing other than a kind of honoring and recognition of difference and celebrating that difference. Um, somehow that even in the United States is being seriously challenged right now. And, and that sort of makes me wonder what sort of spirit is moving across the planet because we're certainly seeing similar tendencies in um, a kind of uh, conservative right-wing uh, movements in Europe, in, uh, in India with Modi, uh, the, um, the desire for a kind of unitary uh, culture um, seems to have been revived when I thought that we had kind of passed that. Do you have any idea, any sort of thoughts about what might have, um, what might be encouraging uh, this uh, transformation of our attitudes? Um, Look, I think that this is a pendulum of history. This is normal because, uh, well, this this goes back to very old uh, philosophical concepts. Um, what is the primary? Is it unity or difference? And this goes back to Plato and his very, very sophisticated dialogues on, on dialectics that nobody understands. But uh, <laughs> Plato, Plato just understands that this is the core of things because uh, this is this is maybe the, the the most important philosophical problem, where how how we build a unity which is kind of a, accepts plurality and how we build a plurality which is more or less solidary, right, and uh, which which does not uh, which is not fragmented, uh, does not split apart. So um, I think that uh, that uh, maybe in America you had you had quite probably similar processes, uh, and um, but but there is really this uh, this breakthrough. I think uh, we can make it. We can call it postmodern or whatever. Uh, in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, all over the world, and then in Europe you have this post-structuralism, which stresses the, the role of difference, but this difference is no longer hierarchical, so it's it really fights fights against this concept of hierarchy. And maybe in some aspects we went too far, because uh, uh, if you are only cherish the difference, the otherness, then you're saying that, look, well, you are the other, you are another, you are not like me, I respect you, but I don't care about you, right? So, uh, you're, and, and this is also a trap, because of course, we, we need to develop a certain certain idea of, of unity uh, among people. And uh, I think right now, uh, Ukrainians are also struggling with this, maybe Orientalism or something like this, when, uh, when we are just telling to the world, look, we are, we are not others we are the same as you we have this the same uh the same uh, wish for freedom we have the same idea of of, of free societies and uh, we are struggling for this 
we are not just an exotic country in which you know people are fighting each other because one one is speaking Ukrainian and another speaks Russian. No, it's not like that. We are just like you, and we we really cherish the same spirit which which was cherishing. I mean, the founding fathers of the America or you know, the the French Revolution or something like this. So. Of course, we we kind of a need to go into this way. How to 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 be in the unity but cherish plurality, and how to be in plurality but at the same time have this spirit of solidarity. I love very much the phrase of my friend uh, Vachtan Kibuladze, Ukrainian philosopher, who said that there is a difference between totalitarianism and democracy. Democracy is the society of uh, solidary competitors. So there should be a fight, there should be a competition, but they kind of have this sense of solidarity. Totalitarianism is is a society of uh, of the atomistic enemies. Uh, a, a, when he's saying about atomistic enemies, he means that as soon you you remove this hierarchical structure, everything turns into the war of all against all. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is this is the the also the root of of this maybe far right revisionism or revanchism is that they are coming from people who are actually not feeling very well in the society not not able to talk with others and uh, and to understand each other they are feeling that they are surrounded by enemies and therefore they need to have this superstructure which would uh, keep them together I think this is one of the key reasons of Putinism in Russia, because as 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 far as we see the Russian society, how the how they talk, how they respond to questions in in the public opinion polls, what movies they they watch, and how their soldiers behave in Ukraine, that's the most critical thing, is that it's obviously kind of a culture of violence, where violence is considered as a essential part of power. You only have power on others if you can exert violence on others. That's, that is something very pervert, but very present in, in, this, in this Russian culture. And I think this is kind of uh, leads to Putinism uh, in, in, a, in, a very, in a very specific way. Yeah, I mean, again, what you're describing uh, certainly uh, coincides with my sort of understanding of the tone and temper of the right wing here as well. And of course, it sounds like the kind of culture of violence that was a central um, element of Nazism. Um, you know, it, it's... Um, it's interesting because you also uh, note that um, the Soviet Union uh, was the result of a victory for Westernizers, progressive, atheist, often materialist intellectuals and activists. And yet this very victory gave rise to the most anti-Western empire in Russian history. And that itself is, you know, one of those puzzling paradoxes um, that, that, that uh, the idea of um, having absorbed certain aspects of uh, the Enlightenment and then you know, having created this sort of distinction of the, the, the more than a distinction between church and state, but a destruction of the church and the domination of the state, um, it, it has a. I, I have a hard time seeing the where it made that sort of transition. Was it simply a kind of the a, a matter of the megalomaniacal and paranoid leaders at the top, or were there deeper roots? Uh, that led to this um, turn against the West and again, you know, I mean, you, you, w w one thinks of the way in which uh, w Russian culture revered uh, French culture, um, the, the 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 way in which um, the sort of uh, at least at least the elites in Russia intermarried with Europeans. All right, there was that sense of the, that there would be a, more of a kind of closer communion, and you wonder. Um, how it is that, was it a matter of individuals or was it something more deeply rooted in the culture that led to this sort of uh, rise of the culture of violence and uh, a worship of that? Look, I think, I think it's very deep and um, you should, we should read Dostoevsky to understand it. <laughs> I've read, yes. not, not, not only his big novels, but one of the phrases in his uh, writer's diary when he says, mm -hmm. okay, look, but... Uh, uh, the so-called westernizers, when they come to Europe, they become even much more cr critics of, of Europe than the, the Slavophiles. 
And uh, he, of course, had in mind uh, people like Herzen or maybe some others. But this is a paradox of, of the Russian history, and it was described not by by myself. It was also described by the Russian writers, like Dmitry Marishkovsky was one of those I remember who pointed to this paradox, is that why the biggest tyranny comes in, in Russia with people who initially wants to uh, bring Russia to Europe. Uh, and he, of course, mentioned uh, meant Peter I, uh, because Peter I, well, uh, he, he also remarkable for his extreme cruelty. And uh, Mereshkovsky wrote a novel about Pyotr i Alexei, about the murder of his son. Uh, and this uh, this was very uh, very important moment. Then, if we take, for example, uh, the next century, Alexander the first, he was very much pro-European, even you know part of the maybe Masonic some uh, societies. But then uh, he 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 got a victory over Napoleon, and that's it. And then it led to very anti-republican, anti-revolutionary regime of, of his and then Nicholas the first. So the Bolsheviks, the, the paradox that really that I point out that the Bolsheviks is a, is a result of the big struggle of ideas in Russia in the 19th century be, between Slavophiles and the Westernizers. And this is, was the victory of the Westernizers because it comes from the tradition of Herzen and then the nihilists of the 60s and then people like I don't know, Pisarev, Blikhanov, uh, Chernyshevsky, and all the others. So th this is the kind of uh, continuation. And then suddenly when they took power, they turned <laughs> this Russia into the most really anti-Western uh, incarnation of the, of the Russian Empire. So Putin is probably the same because he mm. was kind of also continuation of the Yeltsinism. He was not a a rupture from the Yeltsinism. He was a natural continuation of the Yeltsinism, mm. and then gradually he moved to this uh, to this horrible thing. And this is really something that Russians should think about and understand where 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 are those roots of this because. Uh, I also contrast the Ukrainian intellectual culture with Russian intellectual culture in this aspect, because in Ukraine, being a Westernizer or being a Slavophile, well, it do, this 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 discussion does not exist. First and secondly, okay, you can see the discussion between traditionalists and modern modernists, and both of them, traditionalists and modernists, would be saying that Ukraine needs to be with Europe, right? And the Ukrainian version of uh, Slavophilism was rather a version of Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood that was rather close to the Slovak and Czech ideas of the Slavic unity. So basically to, to the Western Slavs and to Eastern Slavs. And, um, and this is it. I mean, uh, and that's that's a paradox. So in Ukrainian intellectual history, the consensus is that we are part of Europe. In Russian political history, intellectual history, the consensus is that we are not part of Europe. Or I would say that if, if it's even more complicated. Russians want to be an Asia for Europe. So they they want Europe to understand them as Asia. And the problem is that they still continue to be kind of a Europe in this, but the kind of anti-Europe within Europe. And therefore all their, their senses are the reflections and distortions of these senses that they got from the West. Look at, look at the way how they portray right now Ukraine. They're saying that Ukraine is totalitarian. Okay, they, they were saying that Ukraine is fascist and Nazi. We we all know that, all this, all this bullshit. But then they are saying now that Ukraine is totalitarian. And then this is a country of slaves. Well, this is what we are we are saying about Russians, but with certain sense because Russians don't have a democracy, they don't have a pluralism of media. Ukraine all, all has all these elements of democracy, and still Russians are saying, no, 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 we are the real democracy. So they are not really describing themselves in the in the kind of a terms, kind of alternative to to the idea of democracy. They just change. The very sense of the word democracy, they just use it in a very different way. So they want to be an Asia for Europe. And um, 
this is the paradox because now they're increasingly turning into kind of a, into Europe for Asia, and that will be a very different task for them because, and very unpleasant task because, as you rightly said, well, uh, Pushkin was inspired by the French poetry and not by the Chinese one, and uh, Chadaev and Tuchas were writing in French and not in. In, in Farsi. So, uh, of course, their, their roots are in, 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 in European culture, but they kind of always deny it. My, my metaphor is that they take all the content from the Western cultures and then put it to the extremes. And to the extremes, like Dostoevsky is the writer of the extremes. He, he takes one emotion, one idea, and just leads us to, to extreme. And in this extremity, there is kind of a, at a certain level, there is no capacity to make a distinction, no capacity to make a difference, because you are thinking in the realm of so-called infinity. Russians always despise borders between countries, between cultures, and between concepts. If you read Russian literature, I quoted Merishkovsky, for example, you can read lots of novels by Merishkovsky, but still not have a idea what he's going to say what what does he want to say because mm -hmm. he he says one thing and then the opposite he he shows that he, sh he shows the ambiguity of everything and i think showing ambiguity of everything is a good element of critical thinking but it is not critical think thinking per se and russians by showing ambiguity of everything they i think they they just lose at a certain moment a an idea of morality because mm -hmm. in in if 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 you can't if you don't have a distinction between anything you just you just um, confuse at a certain moment the good and the evil and um, and the saint and the demon and this is what is happening right now and then well, you, you th then you say that those people who fight against fascism are fascists and those people who are victims of genocide are genociders that's what they're saying right now well um yeah you know the uh, two thoughts come to mind one one is it a um kind of that, that um a common critique of postmodernism was that it, it is um essentially committed to blurring boundaries and blurring definitions and we see that um in the way in which for example in literature uh, the the idea of genres is now completely kind of thrown out the window. We have a, a hybrid forms. All this is partly advanced and encouraged by technology. So um, on the one hand, you do have that sort of blurring of distinctions and boundaries as a very profound um, intellectual force in the West for quite a long time now. Um, the the positive side of it, of course, is, and it's something that we th uh, used to think about it very idealistically, even as late as the 90s, when um, the promise of technology was that it would eventually erase poverty uh, and eliminate hunger, and things did not pan out that way. In fact, um, rather the, things went rather the opposite direction. Um, and uh, but but you thought that uh, you know the idea of some kind of of world culture, not so much that there would be one kind of intellectual or literary canon for the whole world, but rather there would be a common recognition or a recognition of our common humanity that would allow and encourage a kind of peaceful coexistence of these various cultures um, required some sort of common foundation of for values. And you know, so you talk about the um, erasure of morality, and I was speaking about this with, with with a writer friend the other day. And where do we find once more that kind of common text um, that offers uh, a kind of moral code to which uh, three people uh, on any given block in this country could agree? What do you do when telling the truth ceases, ceases to be something a culture values? Well, this is a very very difficult question, of course, but. Uh... But I think uh, we should, uh, well, in a way, we should uh, we should see how this idea of plurality uh, and difference works for, for for the better and for the best. I think the the idea of humanity is to preserve uh, as much creativity, as much plurality as possible, and this should be a, one of our kind of narratives and one of our regulatory idea uh, of course it is difficult for any any um, single mind to accept this plurality uh, 
uh, we understand this, uh, especially in Ukraine when you really have, you know, when when your conscious becomes very narrow. Actually, it's it's very hard to have this idea of plurality during during the war. But still, I think the the this is this is the fight for for plurality as well. Uh, fight against the the force that uh, that is unifying, that is that is erasing plurality, that is erasing erasing differences. As I said initially, uh, maybe this can be our oh, foundation, one of our foundation. The next foundation, I think, it's it's a kind of a new type of biophilia, uh, and and this is something that we gradually go in in the twenty first century. Uh, as we uh, suddenly, well, not suddenly, gradually extend uh, the very concept of morality to other beings, not only human beings, uh, other living creatures, and uh, I, I personally think that this is this is really great. Something great is going on uh, because we are we are revising our concept of of nature. Uh, we are uh, we are revising our concept of ethics. We increasingly, we as humanity, increasingly think that dignity, for example, is not only the concept for human beings; but it is also a concept for for other living living creatures, uh, for animals, maybe for plants as well. Of course, we we also should pose the question: where 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 it ends? Where does this? level limit of of life and and living living beings ends but i think this is this is the great horizon for us and this is something in which modernity and tradition can actually find find a place together because well, tradition is is primarily about living uh, in, in line with nature right uh, and the modernity kind of splits with it but our I would say it's not already postmodernity; it's something different. It's it's kind of an eco modernity. I would call it in this way, right? So it's 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 an idea how we can use modern technologies to rebuild that that feeling of of harmony with nature that we have. And by the way, on this, I I really I do have hope for Ukrainian culture as well because Ukrainian culture has this very deep uh, ecological tradition of thinking, right, and and of imagining things so ukrainian culture is very botanic uh, <laughs> where, where where love plants is very also animalistic in a way it has so many pre pre-christian elements i sometimes joke that between catholic poland and orthodox russia we chose uh pagan paganism good in a good sense of the term mm. uh, some kind of pre-christian ideas uh well the and, pantheism that is part of that maybe pantheism because i mean if 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 and and the paradox is that our biggest pantheist literature comes from the our modernists from uh, lesy ukraine and sure. from kotsubinsky right sure. so this is this is also an element where modernism and traditionalism coincide in ukrainian culture and i think this is also some something in which ukraine can give a certain ideas for the world right because the world is now split in america this is a split between the progressivism and traditionalism but i don't know how you call it mm -hmm. uh, in in britain you have the same in france you have the same in poland you have the same and ukrainians in this way they kind of are trying to seek another way and say okay there is a point where mod modernization and creativity and traditionalism actually coincide and let's let's look for this point and i think this echo echo thinking can be can be one of one of these ways that's very um, i i couldn't agree with you more i i um, think that one of the most exciting um uh, uh areas in which uh, we are beginning to kind of into which we're beginning to move and, and and deepen our knowledge is precisely the recognition of, if you will, the language of the natural world. Um, there is so much more sort of research being done and kind of really close scientific studies that are um, now documenting the way in which trees communicate with each other right through the you know, through the fungi underground. Um, I was reading in the Washington Post just the other day that they have now discovered that spiders themselves have REM sleep and dream. You know the the the, the that sort of uh, um, that uh, 
nature speaks and it's and you're quite right that i mean i had just recently reread lesho Grinka's uh, song of the forest and there you have an animate natural world that literally sort of uh, is embodied and speaks to to and with humans and you've got that kind of greater sensitivity to the natural world that has not been lost in in in, in the best of ukrainian literature that has now been revived and has uh, become a kind of uh, intellectual an important intellectual force throughout the world i don't know if you're familiar with a, a group in uh, england called uh, writers rebel it's an eco uh, it's a group of writers who are kind of committed to um working on behalf of the environment who are staging protests against sort of uh, coal plants and so on and against fossil fuel development um so yeah i i, I completely agree that that is um a, a hugely positive development and the direction in which the world can choose to go in and i similarly agree that the sort of uh, uh that our ability to discover the way in which different cultural streams can uh support and uh, enlarge each other uh, is um, a possibility and a truly valuable one. I always think that the most sort of the greatest period in English literature was the Elizabethan period when you suddenly began to have these continental influences coming into the literature. You had uh, sonnets from Italy, you had French forms uh, coming into the uh, English poetry and that kind of collaboration and cultural energy that uh, infused, uh, that, that entered uh, English itself led to Shakespeare and so on, that kind of enlargement of sensibility. And uh, who is our Shakespeare? Is precisely Lesa Ukrainka because <laughs> I think I think they're really comparable in terms of the the the, the power of the drama, and they're comparable in their horizon because Shakespeare has the variety of topics, incredible variety of topics, from uh, ancient British history to Roman history to Italy, whatever else, and and so does Lesa Ukrainka because. Uh, when you take her dramas, then uh, Lisova Pisnia and Boyarenia are probably the only ones centered in Ukraine. All, all everything rest right. is, is centered Sandra, in right. the Roman Empire, right. in, in, in America, in, right. in Britain, whatever else. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Yeah, um, so that. <laughs> That's on the plus side of the ledger, and, and and it's good to have that in mind because it's um it's too easy to be sucked into the darkness that we're also sort of surrounded by and fighting against. And I do think it's so essential to keep reinforcing these other developments that are simultaneous, um and and parallel and toward which we can lean and move. So this is kind of a, a, a maybe a very simple question, but it's sort of important to me in, in, in different for different reasons. I mean, you know, how do you distinguish between kind of culture and society? Because you know, I, let, 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 let me just kind of clarify what I mean. Is you know that that, that it's hard for it would be hard from I'd be hard pressed to define American culture, but I would say that you know I would certainly be tempted to start speaking about Whitman and Emily Dickinson, say as avatars of two powerful tendencies in the American spirit, one that is very outward and uh, extraordinarily embracing of experience and democratic and, and fleshly and bodily, and the other one which is more hermetic and inward and 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 um, differently mystical, though both have their mystical streaks. Uh, but I wouldn't say that, that you know, th that is what I would propose is the sort of, um, th those are two of the emblems of, of American culture that I'd like to have others recognize as essential components of the American soul. However, I would not say that American society, as I kind of look at it when I look when I look at popular culture, necessarily reflects or embraces uh, that that culture. There is, you know, there, there there seems to be a. To what degree do you, you know, I think we sometimes treat them as synonyms. And yeah. Right. Well, I, I think that culture is uh, is uh, society's unconscious, and uh, hmm. uh, it it is not present in it, it might be not present in 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 some ordinary ordinary life, but it is present uh, during some. Uh, I think two episodes. The first is dreams, of course, and the second is some critical situations. These grand situation, uh, the, the the situations where where there is a, a really question about to be or not to be, and uh, this is it. The, when we talk about Ukraine, right? Uh, there were lots of sociological 
studies about the way how which values are present in Ukraine, the values of freedom or the values of obedience, uh, certain patriarchy. And it appears in sociological studies that lots of pat- uh, this patriarchal society or society of those people who actually expect some assistance from the state or hate everybody else because they, they do not w- get what they want. But the real question is what, what erupts during these moments of crisis. And I think this is, uh, this is something that we see the spirit of freedom and a spirit of self-organization. So mm. what you are, you, we might ask, okay, whether Ukrainian society is really self-organizing, and the answer is probably no in a, in a, in ordinary situations because sometimes I see it in in the neighbors of my house, uh, multi-story building. It it's it's very difficult to get them together and to you know to organize some things together. But when those critical situations come, everybody works as a as a kind of self-organized organism. Mm. Maybe it's maybe this is also the the trait of any society. I don't know. That would be very interesting to to understand. But uh, here, probably, w- where culture and society might coincide, because the key uh, thinkers, the key poets, are just understand it and see better uh, what what society might be. So they they really look at the society as a how you say Husin in English? Uh, as as a, um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you. The, the butterfly. What what oh, what what is the embryo of a butterfly? Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, the cocoon. Yeah, the, the cocoon. cocoon. So yeah. probably the the chrysalis. The chrysalis. Yeah, the chrysalis. The chrysalis yeah. Right. The chrysalis. Yeah. The in in, uh, in French. Yeah. So probably Taras Shevchenko just looks at this chrysalis and and sees the butterfly and hmm. uh, suddenly. During sure. the moment of crisis, it is really a butterfly. Mm-hmm. So this is probably the difference. And then when I'm saying that um, the key element of the Ukrainian political culture, the concept of gromada, which was developed by Drahomanov, mm-hmm. uh, in the peaceful times, you're probably not noticing it very much. But on the 24th of February and 25th of February, it just appeared so well mm-hmm. because you you have the checkpoints everywhere. Every village has its little army to defend itself, and it was so remarkable when uh, when people started self organizing without really any orders from from above. So I would I would define it in this way, and the question is of course whether these aidos of a nation uh, it expresses itself. Okay, it expresses itself in the critical situations, but whether it is able to express itself in normal situation. And I think that's that's something which is a problematic in Ukraine because it's it's it can be so fantastic and so heroic right now. But what will happen? Imagine, uh, of course, we all all believe in our victory, uh, but what will happen after this victory? There is a risk that society will will turn back from the butterfly into this chrysalis, right? And go into inertia of, of something. There is there is a danger of... Of, of course, of course. Well, you know, we, we're speaking um, practically on the eve of September 11th here. And what you're saying reminds me of that period of national unity and coming together uh, uh, in the face of that particular crisis and that tragedy. And there was that sense of... Uh, of you know, collective spirit uh, of resistance that had dire consequences later uh, and was severely a moment that was severely misunderstood in at least from my point of view and in in, the, in its follow-up and led to um, profound destruction uh, utterly unnecessary destruction in so many parts of the world you know it's it's one of the things that that um I'm always sort of mindful uh, that I live inside an empire that has uh, done, done uh, many evil things and has caused a great deal of damage and so i never want to romanticize it um in fact indeed absolutely but uh, there is a difference of your empire and russian empire that you agree, you, sure. you are you you can talk about it and there are lots of americans who talk about it and you yes, you change yes. you you feel your responsibility when i'm talking about collective responsibility americans have collective responsibility for the racism, for the slavery, 
for the uh, annihilation of the indigenous people. Absolutely. But you change. I think you change. Well, it's a struggle, but it's a struggle. You know, there it's, it, a, struggle. It, 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 it's a very kind of a dynamic process right now. And many of us are concerned about how it's going to come out. And that is, I think, one of the reasons that you have this. And this kind of leads me to the next area I wanted to talk about, because, uh, um, you know, it, it's uh, this one of the reasons that I think that we in the United States are following what has happened in Ukraine and are so moved by it is precisely because we see it as a struggle on, on behalf of democracy and democratic values and pluralism. Those are the sort of elements that I think are very identifiable to some of us. But there is also another strain within the United States that is, um, uh, well, sometimes overtly, as our um, uh, previous president, uh, uh, when, when Putin began his invasion, said, well, that was genius, you may recall. Uh, and and there is a uh, th that side of the American kind of society that is siding with Orban and with authoritarianism itself, and um, so 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 it, there's it's definitely a tension inside this society and culture as well. Um, I hope that we too prevail in our in, in our struggle, and uh, and and we are watching, and and we 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 are with you because your 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 struggle and victory are essential for ours as well. I believe um, the. Uh, other thing that, but, but that leads me to wonder, what do you see as the kind of differences in perception and understanding of Ukraine uh, between kind of Europe and the United States? I've had several conversations with friends who have suggested that there is a, um, a more um, sympathy uh, for Russia in Europe than there is in the United States, which has kind of profoundly surprised me. Is that what you've seen? I think that Europe in, is a, is a hostage of its faith that security mm. is already a commodity that you mm. buy in a supermarket and uh, you pay increasingly less a price for it. <laughs> and this is this is a problem I think for Europe. Europe believed too much in this uh, eternal peace. Its very ideas built that uh, we have built a continent of peace and after the second world war there was no major wars on the european continent that is wrong i tell europeans all the time you look on not <laughs> where you should be looking at you should be looking at the real origins of the uh, european union and that is the pan europa the treaties by a f fan fantastic austrian uh, which is who is called uh, Richard von Kudenhofe Kallergi. His text in 1923, actually, well, I think 1922 even, after the collapse of the Habsburg Empire. And uh, basically, the founding fathers of the European Union, Robert Schumann, Jean Monnet, they really admired this person. And they were still in this line of people. Then there, there was this re rewriting of the european history in a way that that you now see in all these textbooks with nice blue and yellow you know covers uh which because if you look at what kudenhofe kalergi was saying he was saying look there is a great danger of two imperial projects the germanic one and the russian one he was writing in 1922 in germany you have Weimarer Republic, no trace of the older empire, everything chaotic and anarchy. He saw that Germanic empire will come back with Hitler, etc. Ten years before Hitler actually came. Uh, with the Russian empire, yeah, it was Soviet Union, everything kind of also anarchic. Soviet, the year of establishment, Soviet Union, Lenin with also ideas of self-determination of nations. And, but then he said, okay, guys, next partition of Poland is inevitable. But something like that, you know. He understood that in order to, uh, to make the imperial extension impossible, smaller nation states should unite and form uh, our, what in the 19th century people called the Republic of Nations. And I think this concept, Republic of Nations, is is one of the most important in the world right now, because we we all should should be also striving to this. Uh, and we failed with League of Nations, we failed with United Nations, but uh, we should still work on this. And this is an old concept. And uh, 
And he understood that uh, the, the key idea of what he called United States of Europe is basically to protect the, to protect itself against the big empires that will uh, extend, right? And um, when European integration started developing after collapse of the one of this imperial project, the Germanic one, it, it was still kind of developing in a sense that, okay, empires are kind of obsolete, they are misunderstandings, they will soon disappear somehow. Europe relies upon the security provided by United States and NATO. And this is the, the truth that Europeans do not want to accept. When I was in France, for example, with good friends and good people supporting Ukraine, but there was so much upset that asking, so why Ukrainians you choose United States rather than Europe? I say, how come? Why? Why why you 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 pick this decision? Why why you why will you you think like that? They they were really jealous about it and somehow I was I was saying no we are the same world we are the same free world there is no division profound division between Europe and United States with some people in France I saw when I was asking them do you see that do do you think that you know Trump and Putin are the same threat I understand that for anti trumpists in 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 the United States for for the democratic people in the in, more general sense of the word, Trump is some kind of a, a nightmare, fascism, or whatever else. But America showed that it can cope with it, I think. And uh, you cannot c really compare Trump with Putin because Putinism is all about, all, all Russia is Putinist. Mm -hmm. uh, only half of America, maybe, or I think even less, is Trump. Sure, less, and you still less. have. You still have this resistance, uh, and, and this is very important. So I think that Europeans overestimate this um, this guarantee of security. They um, they really believed in in this illusion that the war uh, that the war will not be possible, and that the European Union is. Uh, itself by itself by its economic integration safeguards against the war this is mm -hmm. this is a mistake of course and uh, therefore i'm now telling the europeans look uh, look what russians were saying last year all this ultimatum they were bringing to the west did you read it literally because you need to read it literally what they were saying is that european security should be based upon two pillars one American, the other is Russian. What does this mean? This means they want to come back to 1945. This means that they want to divide Europe once again. This is real. This is what, what, what they say literally, without any metaphors. And then I say, okay, imagine Trump comes back to power in America. And then Russians come to Trump and say, okay, we will help you to fight China. We will make a war together against China. But for that, you give us half of Europe. That means, what does it mean? You just uh, withdraw from NATO. And I'm asking Europeans, do you think this scenario is utopian? I would, I would, I would not say that anything is utopian right now. But imagine this uh, United States withdraw for, from NATO and Ukraine is the last bastion against Russian army. Is, any, is there any other army in Europe which is able to confront the Russian army right now? Maybe Polish one, but certainly not German, not French, not any other else. So this is the sad reality. And uh, I think Europeans are living, many of them, not all of them, but many of them are living in a kind of a still illusion. Mm. Yeah, um, you know, it's... It... <laughs> Jefferson spoke about the boisterous sea of liberty, and I'm reminded that democracy is not a gift but a prize, and something that you need, in fact, always to keep fighting for and to maintain. Um, it, that that desire for security, you know, it reminds me of a poem by um, the Elizabethan poet Ben Jonson, who said that security it is the common moth that eats at arts and wits and destroys them both. It lulls us into a kind of deep sleep, and we awaken in a nightmare. And 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 that is um so yeah I. Um, 
that's what you've said is quite sobering and 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 a powerful sort of thought experiment too to consider that sort of division um there are many more uh, uh questions that we could probe in in this area i just want to uh, touch on two other points here one is um that you on your website and we've heard so much about disinformation and so on is there anything you want to sort of say about how to uh, uh na navigate uh this uh very increasingly complex uh landscape of news and information that's it it seems to me a universal problem but one that's especially pointed right now in regard to ukraine um, i have spoken to friends who have who follow certain websites here in the united states and they have a very different sense of history and what is happening even here in the united states and never mind friends who are in india uh and elsewhere or or in greece who who um I had a friend who said that in in, in Greece he had heard that uh, um, it was that the, the United States had been threatening Russia with nuclear war, and that is why uh, uh, Russia had invaded. You know, so there are all kinds of uh, so much disinformation that it's you know I think both of us as teachers need to wrestle with this question about how to prepare students uh, to, for um, learning how to uh, differentiate between. Uh, Again, truth and lies, useful information and disinformation. Any any sort of uh, easy answers for that? Well, easy, no, but uh, a few points, I think. Uh, first point, disinformation is not the biggest um, uh, enemy, I think, in the information field. For me, the biggest enemy is dehumanization. Mm -hmm. And uh, Russian propaganda was primarily about dehumanization. Uh Russian propaganda is mostly built upon opinions, upon emotions, not upon even, even slightest work with facts or with reality. And if you follow the Russian Russian TV, it was precisely about to prove that Ukrainians are Nazis, that uh, Europe is collapsing, and that America is collapsing, and mm. uh, and etc. And uh, the idea to dehumanize the enemy was the key idea actually mm. of this propaganda so i think everywhere when you, when you see this dehumanizing mm -hmm. messaging uh, is is actually and especially if they're coming from not from just users from people but they're coming from the uh, from the from some tv stations especially state uh, state owned tv stations well of course we should avoid it and we should understand that there is something behind it. And um, therefore, for Ukrainians, it's a very difficult task right now how not to be in this dehumanizing spirit. Of course, there is hatred of Russia and Russians, obvious, but uh, but I'm just thinking how to how to make this hatred into rather into indifference. And how to avoid uh, this very simplistic thinking, uh, but of course it's very, it's 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 very difficult in the current sort of circumstances. Obviously, when when people lo lose their their sons, their their relatives, it is very difficult. So the first thing is, thing is to understand that the goal of propaganda is to dehumanize, and only then to disinform. The second thing is to have trust renewed trust to journalists so uh whether journalists are good or they are bad they're they're good in the job they're, they're bad they still have in their job description to kind of to aspire to, to 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 build truth and to verify facts and they can really suffer for not doing that uh this is the difference between journalists and bloggers and uh, politicians and all the rest. We, we do have to rehabilitate this profession. Doesn't mean that everybody is good in this profession, but I think everybody can, can more or less understand, okay, this is top three, top five media to whom, uh, whom I, I, I will trust. And, um, and the sec and the third thing, uh, well, the I think the emotions are also very problematic. So we are acting online. Online demands from us very quick emotions, very quick reactions. Emotions are the fastest things in our mind. Uh, there is a great book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking sure. Fast and Slow, 
So it's better to be on the slow thinking side right. uh, many times, and uh, rather than on the on the fast thinking, uh, fast thinking side. And um, when you mentioned this Greek, the, the narrative in Greece, uh, I think we should still we should, of course, you you can read. What is going on is a kind of a fight of, between different imperialism, and you can say, okay, they they are both bad. But I think we are dealing with imp Western imperialism, which is trying to be critical of, of itself, and uh, I would say, how to say these words, um, kind of uh, repentant. Can mm -hmm. we say repentant? Yes, repentant sure. Imperialism, imperialism that accepts its fall, maybe. In some aspects, it's not sincere, but at least the discourse is there. And the other Russian imperialist, which which says that decolonization was bad, that it was a mistake, mm -hmm. that empires are the only nations that can actually have a right to exist, that all, politics is only about big power, and uh, no deimperialization will be in, in our history, in their history. So there is a discussion in America about the Iraq war. There is no discussion in Russia about Afghanistan war or mm -hmm. Ukraine uh, so-called special military operation. I think that this is the difference. This is the key difference. Uh, in the Western society, you have a chance that a crime will be punished and that there will be justice. Russian society is built upon the idea of impunity impunity therefore with my wife tanya tanya harkova i always quote her in 2014 she just put a very concise conceptualization of kind of a light motif of the russian culture is crime without punishment and punishment without crime and this mm, is very brilliant. important that's that's fabulous oh, yeah yeah oh. Oh, this great. this this is what describes uh, all this uh, all these crimes. This is what describes gulags when people were sent to to death without any crimes, without any. This describes many things. Uh, that I, I hope that, that that she has a, working on a monograph with that title because that says so much. Um, yeah, well, well then, so just finally, and again, there we we could go on. There's uh, th th those are all wonderful points. Um, I. You know, the question I get asked most often by friends when I talk about the war is also a wonderfully American question. And I say that in a very sort of positive spirit that is, what can I do? Um, I'm delighted to hear that question, but I'm always I'm just not sure about how best to direct people. Is there anything that you would want to suggest? Well, uh, I think the key thing is to uh, to support Ukraine and support the idea of Ukrainian victory and understand that uh, Ukrainians are really paying a big price and there is a very important element not only of course it's important to support Ukraine to maybe to donate funds to to organize humanitarian actions etc etc but the key thing is to ensure that American support does not does not stop because Ukrainians are paying with their lives but in terms of weapons we are still in a big big disadvantage and uh, this is also the question of Russian impunity uh, there was a recently article by Ukrainian chief commander Valery Zaluzhny you know how surprised how psychoanalytical was the article written by the our key uh, chief commander because mm -hmm. His conclusion was precisely that, that the, the key idea of the Russian war is to have the sense of impunity. They feel the sense of impunity. They can bomb Russia, Ukrainian cities without Ukrainians bombing Russian cities. And uh, it doesn't mean that Ukrainians want to bomb Russian cities. We, we, we don't... We, don't care about these Russian cities. We we want them just to live in their cities and, and not take us. But... Uh, we should end this this story of impunity, which lasts from uh, at least Stalinism or even earlier. So I think this is it. And um, when we're talking about the risks of the uh, you know, American politics, 
I think it's very important to to support to to sustain this bi bi party support uh, of, of Ukraine, even uh, if there are changes in in government that it does not affect uh, the support for Ukraine. I think that this is the key thing. Um, Volodymyr Yelolenko, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation and great points. Um, I look forward to continuing it another time. Thank you, Ascol. Great honor for me.